welcome to Postmodern. On this episode, my goal is to describe the relationship between postmodernism and education. Here to join me is Brian Lynch. Brian is a founding board member of Veritas School and has been headmaster at Veritas since 2002. He teaches rhetoric and humane letters to 11th grade students. He serves as a board member of the Society for Classical Learning and is a visiting accrediting administrator for the Association of Classical and Christian Schools. His first 20 years of teaching were at Newburgh High School, where he taught AP European History, European Humanities, and coached football, basketball, and softball. Brian was a Fulbright Exchange teacher to the UK and spent one summer in Paris on a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship studying Gothic architecture. He and his wife, Anne, have three children, all of whom graduated from Veritas. Brian has a master's in education from Linfield College in McMinnville, where he majored in history and secondary education. Now, on to the interview. Hello and welcome. My name is Tristan Rickert, and I am here with Brian Lynch. How are you? I'm doing great, Tristan. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the goal for this episode is to describe the relationship between postmodern postmodernism and education. How has it uh, affected education? Um, so we're going to start out with the question that I have started out with, with every guest so far. Uh, what is postmodernism? So I think the, the easiest way to understand postmodernism, I think, is looking at what what Gene Veith does in his Postmodern Times, where he talks about uh, premodernism. And then modernism and then postmodernism. So uh, we could talk in more detail later, but I think in essence, postmodernism is that which comes after the modern. Mm-hmm. Um, it's modernism downstream. Uh, it shares some some ideas of the modern, um, but without the optimism. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a pessimistic, individualistic modernism. So we we maybe go back and talk a little bit more about. The pre-modern, the modern, the postmodern, but it really is. I mean, it's a time period. Po- the postmodern is a time or a uh, a period after the modern, and it's also an ism. We talked, so we distinguish between Veith distinguishes between the postmodern and postmodernism. Postmodern being the time um, in culture and society, and the ism having to do with the ideas and in the worldview. So when we talk about postmodernism. We're talking about the worldview of this our time after all the optimistic program of the enlightenment and the modern period that after that's pretty well fallen apart what now and and that's what we're in okay uh what let's start talking about education um so what is the what is the fundamental purpose of education and you can look at this i mean historically so maybe we could talk about what that was yep pre-modern, modern, and post-modern. Right. So, um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll use that, that framework if that's okay. So for, mm-hmm. for pre-modern times, um, well, maybe, maybe a, a time frame. So some people think about modernism as basically the Enlightenment, say, um, say the French Revolution, 1789, up to the fall of communism in Eastern Central Europe. So 1989, that, that, that's you know, very broad and, and too easy, but that gives you an idea. So before that, in, in the pre-modern period, um, the emphasis was on the self, the, the reality of the cosmos. The cosmos was there, that there are transcendent values um, that exist apart from us, and truth truth was a real thing. And, and so the purpose of education is to equip us, equip students, equip children for that world. That, and that's true of any era. That's what education is about. How do we equip this next generation for the world they live in? And if, and if you're in pre-modern times, you assume that there is a world, there's a cosmos, uh, there's a God, a creator. All those things are objective outside of us. Then the purpose of education is to fit us into that. Uh, we have a we have a duty to conform ourselves to the reality of that cosmos, um, and that's and that's done through um, studying the, you know the, the great works, the, the masters, the uh, 
imitation of, of the of what came before through virtue um, and you were trying to be um, you know, you're trying to become eloquent in, in the classical model um, but but it's about fitting us and shaping ourselves to the pre-existent realities it's not we we don't decide what's true and what's objective what's real it's already there we fit ourselves to it does that make sense yeah okay so that's that's pre-modern uh, as i understand it um and then in the shall i go on to modern or mm -hmm. is it yeah i'll keep going by all means so in sometime in the in the 18th century that began to shift 18th century, certainly by the 19th century where the emphasis changes from um, a reliance upon transcendent traditional ideals and values to to something new so the the enlightenment and those who went downstream from the enlightenment despised the tradition they despised and rejected um certainly uh, religion, society, culture, all, all the things of the past were, uh, were to be swept away. And they were highly skeptical about the past, about tradition, those things are already there. They were highly optimistic though, which is interesting, skeptical about tradition, but optimistic about human ability and, and reason to understand the world. So the, the modernists um, really substitute an autonomous system their, their own of their own making for the, the traditional ones um, so they, they untethered themselves from transcendence and th thought through human reason they could come up with uh, a better system right Tra tradition had failed but human reason alone could figure things out very very optimistic about that um, C.S. Lewis writes about this in the abolition of man which would be if your listeners haven't read that, that would be a good place to start to understand. He's writing in the 40s, but he's already seen where you know, the effect of modernism and really the beginning of the demise of modernism as well. So if that's what the world is, if, if the world really is a thing that we, um, it exists perhaps outside of us, but in the modern way of thinking, you really can't understand it except by autonomous human reason. And, and so we create the understandings, the systems um, that correspond with that. There's really nothing transcendent. There's no values. There's no, may, maybe there's a creator, right? The, you know, the deists believed in maybe a first cause, but that's not the same thing as a, a God, um, you know, the God of the Bible that decides what morality is, that kind of thing. So it's really our reason that, um, that will create the better systems. So if that's the world, if you look around, that's what the world looks like, then education will fit that. And by the, the 19th century, um, the other, so the other thing, you have the Enlightenment, the other thing that happens, of course, is the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be um, you know, the Enlightenment applied. It's, it's rational, it's systematized, it's fragmented, it's you know, mass production. Um, everything's standardized and rational. So if that's the world, the world is standardized and rational and mass produced, then education is going to assume to, to fit that as well. So what we'll see in, in the 19th century uh, education is this emphasis on mass production, standardizing the curriculum, standardizing methods. Um, we, we have standardized testing at the end of the, the curriculum. And it's all meant to sort of mass produce um, people to fit into this highly standardized world. Um, so again, education is going to flow from from what your worldview is. Mm -hmm. So th and so that will last. That will last us all the way into the mid late twentieth century. To some degree, it's it's still with us, right? If you if you go on a, you know, a local school district website and wherever that is, and you look at their, their purposes, they're, they're going to have a variety of things on there. You know, they're going to have STEM and literacy and Common Core and they'll have all kinds of things, some of which are modern, um, and, you know, anti-racism and all kinds of other social goals as well as academic goals. So there's, there's a real mix of things. And, that, and that's, so modernism is hanging on while, uh, while postmodernism is sort of beginning to dominate the, what, the way we do things. Mm -hmm. um, 
Shall I go on to postmodernism? Yeah. Okay. I don't, I'm going to do well, all the talking. Okay. You want to stop there for a second? One, one, yeah. one small thing. So are there any um, conflicting views, different thinkers in any of these um, eras of, of, the, of the purpose of education? Did, did different thinkers think different things, uh, perhaps during pre-modernism or modernism? Yeah, good question. So if you look at the pre-modern, um, you know, Lewis in, in The Abolition Man talks about Aristotle and, and his view that the, the purpose of education is to teach children uh, what they what they should like and what they should not like, right? To shape them to reality that exists already that's outside of them. And this is certainly true uh, in the Christian era. Um, if you read Milton, Milton wrote an essay on, on education and he talks about re- the purpose of education is to repair the ruins of our first parents by getting to know God rightly through his creation, through understanding his creation and that, that wonder which should lead to worship. But, but again, the assumption is that the truth, that truths and reality and the cosmos was already outside of us and our job was to fit ourselves to it. So everywhere from, uh, from Lewis, I'm sorry, from Aristotle all the way up through you know, you read Quintilian and, and Cicero and all the way up through the medievals, you know, all the way to to Milton and even, even a little bit beyond Milton. That's the assumption. And then you get to the 18th century, somebody like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was a Enlightenment, he's a sort of Enlightenment slash um, romantic figure, um, but he embodies, I think, postmodernism in a, in a way as well. But Rousseau writes about education as... Uh, really about the individual and the individual find finding himself in nature right civilization is bad for Rousseau civilization is corrupting the natural state is best so it's really about the, the individual identity and the self and and finding your own place that for Rousseau is most important and that's you know 1700s that's sounding pretty contemporary mm-hmm. right that's postmodernist education has adopted that kind of idea as well all about the self Mm -hmm. uh what was the effect of uh romantic thought and romanticism on education because that's right after the enlightenment and it was kind of seen as a return from pure reason and it brings it brings emotion back into it back into the picture right so with rousseau and and other romantics um the emphasis in education i i'm not sure they ever they ever made much of an inroad into systems of education, although they did emphasize um, the importance of, of the child, the sort of the, the, the goodness of, of a child. And, and someone like, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll maybe I'll come back to that. But so the, the idea there um, is that we ought to work with the nature nature of the, of the child. Um, and, and the feelings and the, the the ideas the the purpose of that individual child and again that that doesn't fit a system very well that that's um very individualistic and so I'm not sure that um, romantics made much of an impact on the education structures of the time but um, maybe later as you know as we get back into the in the 1950s and 60s even there's a resurgence in that kind of thing about back to nature and rejection of the of uh cold industrialism then then i think maybe you see the romantics having an impact there but again the emphasis is on the individual individual child and and uh, their feelings and their i don't know self-actualization perhaps um as opposed to because again, in the modernist education, you're still trying to fit into a system, but it's a system of our making. So education is about conforming children to the system. And the romantics reject that. It, it should be about nature and freedom. So again, by the time you get to the 1960s, you have things like the Summerhill Experiment, where um, it's a school, but there are no rules. Or, or the children decide if there are going to be any rules, or what they're going to study, if anything. Um, so... There's sort of a slow, a slow growth of romanticism, I suppose. By the by, the time we get to the late twentieth century, where modernism seems to have failed in a lot of ways, then then there's room for these romantic ideals of 
children know best and we just have to follow the child let the child follow their own heart those kinds of things mm -hmm. okay so on to on to postmodernism and education specifically so your thoughts on that so um again so with postmodernism if if education is to fit is to fit students for the time uh it postmodern postmodern world there there are no so postmodernism rejection of of modernism certainly modernism has already destroyed tradition and now it's tried reason reason is failing um the modernists uh, had you know highly optimistic ideas about the perfectibility of society and progress and then world war 1 hit hmm. and then world war 2 and particularly in Europe, those things pretty well put an end to um, faith in progress and an optimistic view of reason. Not not quite so much in the United States because you know we we entered World War One late, didn't really affect us the same way. Same with World War Two, um, but those two wars had a devastating effect on the optimism of modernism. So we start entering into the existential and, and postmodernist view of the world. You know, by the 50s and 60s, and you could trace it earlier as well. But so, if that's the world, there is no objective reality. There are no transcendent values. Tradition failed. Reason has now failed. Emotion wasn't good enough. So all you're left with is the individual, and and their desire to create their own identity. Um, so postmodernist education really prioritizes that. Prioritizes individual self-expression and self again self development um, deciding for yourself w what and who you will be and really what what reality is as well relativism is present in modernism for sure but it's it's um it explodes during the postmodern times or our own times because if there are no transcendent values and if reason has failed to discover other another way and there were lots of competing systems during the modern times, all of which seem to have failed. Then um, all you're left with is your own individual identity and view of the world. So um, modernism tried to understand the universe. And postmodernists think there, there is no universe. It, all there is is a multiverse. Mm -hmm. and, then, and it's up to you to decide what it what's right and wrong, what its shape is, what it should do, what it should be like. So how does that look in education? Um, and so there, there are a lot of ways to impact. We could, I guess, I don't know if we do you want to go to that quite or yeah. you ready for me to keep, go ahead. Just what, keep going. What are, what are some examples? Yeah. So in the assumption of education again is it's about the individual. So rather than having a set curriculum, Maybe we, we all need to read the great authors. We all need to read, you know, at our school, we read Homer, we read Virgil, we read Dante, we read Milton, of course, uh, because the, they, are, they represent the, the great tradition. Not, not that we believe everything they say is true, but they, they represent a tradition before us uh, of great works, Shakespeare, you know, Milton, others that, well, I mentioned Milton, but others that, that fit in there as well. And... But for the postmodernists, since since it really is up to me to decide what what is virtue, if there is such a thing as that, or what is a value even, then there really is no canon. Uh, anyone who, and here's the other thing about postmodernism is, if there are no transcendent values, nothing beyond us, then every attempt to say that there's objective truth really is just a power play. Mm -hmm. Because everything is subjective. Everything is subjective. So if I say, oh, Shakespeare is, is the greatest author. Or Milton, Milton's Paradise Lost is, is the greatest work of literature in the Western world, in the world at, at all. Well, that, that's simply a power play on my part. I'm just using words to further my own ends or my group's ends, whether it's Western or traditional or patriarchal or whatever it happens to be. Um, so postmodernism wants to deconstruct everything, cr critique everything, and sees power plays in everything. Every word, every definition, 
every assertion of any kind is a power play. Logic is a power play, assertion of truth, it's all power. Or somebody's attempt at power. Because, because it's all about the individual. So, um, you, so you'll see that in, in what it is we're going to study, right? What the curriculum, we, you can't insist on a, a curriculum that has great, great anything in it because it's really needs to be up to the individual. So I, I was like, as a, on a website today uh, in preparation for this, and I think it was a college website, but this, this professor was talking about their, their class and you know, with their 500 students in these big, massive university classes. But if there are 500 students, then there need to be 500 ways to do this class, right? There are 500 tasks, five, every task, reading, uh, anything that's done is in a postmodernist assumption must be individualized. Now, the problem with that, of course, is you can't do it. It's impossible for a professor to have 500 individual reading lists and papers and tests. And so it's, you know, it's up against reality. And this is, this is part of what we're seeing in postmodernism is it really is a rebellion against reality yeah. and an attempt to individualize it all. And it's also, it's just heavily influenced by um, autonomy. I mean, if there is no, um, if there are no objective virtues and if there are no, if there, if there is no objective truth, then there's nothing that um, holds me to anything. So I can do whatever I like. I can be my own God. And um, that's a very attractive idea on its face because then I can do whatever I want and no one can criticize me. Really, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's departing from uh, what is actually true. Um, and especially as, uh, as Christians, you know, it's very damaging, and it's it's one of the same. I mean, it's it all goes back to the garden, right? Um, they wanted to be their own god. They wanted to to rule themselves. They didn't want to adhere to God's rules. Um, uh, and that's what Satan said: uh, "You will be like gods." Um, and so that lie has heavily influenced um, postmodern culture. So one, one other question that I have is, uh, how should Christians seek to educate their children? Oh, um, yeah, good one. Well, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think, I think you should, Christians should seek to educate their children in the, the fear and admonition of the Lord. Right? They should... Um, teach them to love God with all their hearts, mind, soul, and strength. And however, however they need to do that, whether that's Christian schooling or homeschooling, uh, that needs to be the focus. They, they, and they need fathers in particular are commanded to do that, right? Fathers are to raise their children up and, and not frustrate them by badly educating them. Um, so I, I have said for a long time that um, Christians Christians in, in the public school is a massive mistake. Um, I think more and more people are beginning to see that with the, the social agenda that's, that's coming out you know, in the last couple of years and, and how that's just ramping up. Um, but it was, it's always been true, at least for 60 years anyway, because the, those play, the, the public school system is and must be secular. God, God is irrelevant uh, it's not just neutral, but but God is irrele irrelevant in understanding anything, math, science, history, literature. And education is not neutral. It cannot be because the, the cosmos isn't neutral. God has infused the cosmos with truth, and it's his truth that's behind it all. So to understand anything about the world, you have to understand fully, you have to understand the God who created it. And so if you if you try to just separate something off, even like math, um, you know, you, we can talk about math, what happens to math education. If you try to separate it off, say, well, math is just math, right? Math just works. Uh, and, and that's true. It does work. Uh, and it, it maybe is the last, the, the last uh, bastion that, that, that's going to fall to postmodernism. And it's already beginning to fall. It's been under siege for mm -hmm. several years now. Um, but even math will fall to the postmodernist relativism and subjectivism. Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I, I was talking to a, a friend of mine who's currently um, an engineering student at George Fox, and he made the uh, excellent point: uh, there's no room for relativism in engineering. Well, there shouldn't there shouldn't be if you want your bridge to stand up, yeah, right? Yeah, and the yeah, building's yeah. not to collapse, but that will not that doesn't keep the postmodernist agenda out be- mm-hmm. because if if in fact everything is is power, including numbers and and uh, you know knowledge knowledge numbers words it's all power in the postmodernist view of the world, then why should engineering be any different? Why shouldn't we deconstruct and you know, re- rework engineering um, and mathematics. So, you know, you, you can find sites that will argue for the you know, the whole idea of two plus two equals four everywhere, right? Well, that's true if you're, but, um, you know, it, postmodernists will, because those are words and ideas, every concept, every every word, every idea is is subjective and power, power laden, politically laden. Uh, they will even deconstruct that. Well, what do you mean by two? What do you mean by equal? Um, what do you mean by five or four? Maybe it could be different in my my way of thinking. And if by redefining terms, um, you can confuse the the understanding and, and end up with two plus two is five or six or ten, whatever you want it to be. Um, now, which is not to say that pre-moderns wouldn't talk about that, that as well. What do we mean by two? What is two-ness? What do, we, what do we mean by four? What is a number? And the pre-moderns would talk about numbers as a way of understanding the God who created numberness. Mm. Because it's, you know, what, what is a one? What is two? How, where do we get this multiple of things? Um, again, all of which is, is a way to understand the world. Postmodern though is all about redefining for myself what those things mean. So um, it, it'd be interesting to see how the the battle for the engineering departments go. Because I, I I imagine math departments will will slip mm-hmm. because they're not actually applying it. It's it's you know they're talking about math, and so we can we can subjectivize math and end up with different maths, I suppose hypothetically and sort of you know um creatively which is one of the things postmoderns like to do is just sort of play with conventions play around with numbers but in the engineering department it has to work and it, god has made the world a certain way and um and the computer science be the similar kind of thing right it can only work a certain way it it can't work if we redefine gravity we, we mm-hmm. it's not up to us to redefine gravity um, so when postmodernism gets full, fully in charge of the engineering departments, um, who knows what was mm-hmm. the result. And it could be, we'll just bump, finally bump up against reality enough to realize that it doesn't work. But, you know, we, we haven't discovered that yet in, in all the you know, gender and, and, uh, biology and everything else. So who knows? Mm-hmm. I, I'm not, I'm not as optimistic as maybe some people are about reality mm-hmm. um, surviving. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, at some point there will be a crash. How should, how should Christians react to all this? Okay. So c- coming back, back to, to that, that, I guess. Yeah. I, I got, <laughs> got away from that a little bit. So given, um, so I think what Christians need to do is given what, what education is for, that is to fit your children for God's world and to give them, virtue and godliness and wisdom and eloquence um, then you need to find an education that that does that and that's going to mean it's costly and that's one of the things american christians you know i don't, I don't mean to step on toes and i don't know how many people are going to hear this so maybe i'm safe i don't know um but we we've been pretty lazy about it we've allowed for decades the uh the public schools, the secular, godless government schools to educate our children. And they've done a very good job. They've indoctrinated them into into the ways of, of thinking that religion is neutral at best or absurd um, as well. So it, it's going to cost us something. We're going to have to, and I'm not saying you have to go to a private Christian school like Veritas. Or classical Christian school, although I think it, it is obviously I think it's the best model, 
But there's homeschooling, there's you know, classical conversations, there's all kinds of different ways to do it. But w- we have to divest ourselves of of that system and look for ways to educate our, our children in ways that it is pleasing, honoring to God. Because the mm-hmm. this the system isn't going to change. It, it's going to get increasingly postmodern. Um, there there is a struggle in in the well, it's in, in public schools. Certainly, it's in private schools as well between the old modern ideas um, and the postmodern. And modernism is is lasting. Well, you know, we have Common Core curriculum, those kinds of things in, in schools. And then you have the completely individualistic kinds of goals. So there, there's a struggle over the soul of secular education, whether it's private or public. Mm-hmm. And uh, but education is not neutral, and so we have to get our children into education environments, whatever that means, where um, we are teaching them truth as the truth. And um, there are plenty of schools and systems that that don't allow you to do that. Yeah, and one of the and we've talked about this a bit. Uh, one of the things that postmodernism fundamentally rejects is objective truth um and especially as christians and how we're supposed to react to that i mean jesus said i am the way the truth and the life uh and so we cannot sacrifice the truth for being politically correct or for being uh or for not offending people uh we have to tell the truth as it is um and I, I and I talked about this a little bit uh, in the episode on the church. Um, it's the same with the church. Like the church cannot sacrifice uh, speaking the truth and living out the truth um, for the sake of worldly things. Uh, the the church is supposed to be uh, in the world, but not of the world. Um, and I think we should um, educate the same way. We should uh, teach kids how to live in the world but not be of the world um any thoughts on that yeah so th- i think that's absolutely correct um and and honestly you know it maybe this gets a, it gets a little bit beyond you know where we're the topic of postmodernism but but one of the critiques people sometimes have of private schools is that you're just isolating um we're going to go to the other schools and be salt and light that kind of thing um, but it, it, it's just not, it's just not true. Um, students in a school like ours, let's say in your high school and you're reading, you're reading pagans, you're reading all kinds of things, you know, Homer and Aristotle and Virgil, and, and you're coming up against those and applying your, your think, your biblical thinking, your biblical worldview, uh, up against all kinds of ideas that, uh, are contrary to the Bible. Mm-hmm. And so you're not being, I mean, not that sheltering is a bad thing. I mean, people say, oh, you're just sheltering your children. Said, well, isn't that part of the job of a parent to protect their children? I, I think that's part of the job. Um, or you just throw them out in, you know, you wouldn't, no one would ever just push their kids out in the street all night and just say, you know, go be salt and light in a, in a dangerous neighborhood or something. You're going to protect them. Um, so... It, it's important that as you're educating, we are being consistent with what Scripture is teaching. And, you know, again, wh- wherever you do that, doesn't, it doesn't matter. But it, it is important that, that uh, we understand the world we live in and that the, edu- the education is consistent with that cosmos. We, we don't have the, the freedom to just make the world whatever we want it to be in, in spite of what postmodernists would like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um so I guess one other thing. Um you mentioned uh classical Christian education. Uh what is a classical Christian education and why do you think that is the the ideal form of education? Yeah, so a, a classic well, classical Christian education is first of all Christ-centered to be to be truly Christian, it, it starts with Scripture. Starts with um, the lordship of Christ over all things. Um, you know, Jesus, Jesus is King and Lord. Um, 
God is the creator of all things. And so you can only understand anything truly um, by understanding it through, through scriptural understanding, through scriptural categories and, and, and um, you know, proper biblical thinking. So we have, you have to start there. Um, so there's that. So, but the, the classical, um, classical approach is that of, again, fitting ourselves to the, the reality that, of God's universe, the cosmos. And so what we want to do in, in learning, in education, is, is to try to understand the world as it is and move from, and let that, that understanding move us to, to uh, wonder and, and wisdom, as well as worship, that all education should do that. And we do that through um, reading, studying, thinking, observing, sketching, right? we're doing all, all these things. So it's a well-rounded education. It's not specialist. One, one of the things about modern education is highly specialized. You are, you are trained for a certain task. And we are, we're mass producing consumers and, and you know, loyal or at least um, apathetic, perhaps even citizens or members of society that will do what they're told. Um, it, it, don't, let me forget, don't let me forget to get back to classical here. But it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting that in the 19th century, in the 1800s, um, the, the industrialists and the Marxists had the same goals for education. And you think, where would they ever agree on anything? Well, industrialists and Marxists both thought that the purpose of education was primarily economic. It was to produce good workers. Um, the Marxists wanted universal education so that all of the, all of the youth would learn to do their job in the, the system. And industrialists wanted largely the same thing. They wanted education to be about job training or basic skills so children could operate the machinery and consume things. And so it, it's interesting that these modernists, all they disagree on a lot of things, these modernists, Marxists as well as the big industrialists, had a similar purpose for learning. Classical education isn't about that. It's not about training specialists for a particular place in society. We just drop them into the little boxes. But it's about well-rounded, full person. So people learn how to, how to sing, how to draw, uh, there's body education, there's theological, of course, and, and history, science, math. All of these things are, are encompassed in a classical education. So it's well-rounded, full, full person. Um, and we, we look a lot at, at, at imitating. We look at the traditional and the ancient, not as truth necessarily, apart from scripture, but as, as models of for imitation. They, they have stood the test of time. Someone like uh, Virgil or Dante. Centuries have decreed that these are worth reading. They are worth understanding. Now, they're not always 100% true. We're not, we're not saying that. But at the very least, we need to understand them. So there's there's imitation. Um, there's embracing of of the that which came before us. Um, modernists and, and Modernists, of course, were, were highly, um, you know, highly anti-historical. Anything old was bad. Postmodernists tend to be more open to the past, but just in a, in a pick and choose sort of way. I, mean, I like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You know, you go to some place like, uh, you go to a shopping mall, a, a newly developed outdoor shopping mall, and it's kind of modeled on a, a little village. You supposed to have that village feel, as opposed to. A modernist shopping mall is a massive box with, you know, um, a grid system to get you around efficiently. Yeah. Um, Postmodernists aren't about efficiency; they're about feeling, you know, feeling their way around. Yeah. Um, so, in, in the in the classical education, we we were not about again shaping shaping individuals for a particular task, but about looking at looking at traditional things. Um, critiquing again from a biblical viewpoint growing in virtue and in wisdom and and then of course th that will fit you for all kinds of tasks you will be ready to be a contributing citizen a member of your church member of your family um, but it, it's that's 
that sort of downstream from the education. So it, it's hard to summarize classical education yeah. in 30 seconds, but I think that's, that is generally what we're trying to do. One of the things that I think um, is interesting about modernism and postmodernism, if you, again, as you read C.S. Lewis, he talks about the, the Tao the, or natural law, the you know, traditional morality, and that as being rejected in the 20th century. And it's, I've used this analogy before, but it's like, it's like um, the modernists tore a branch off this very fruitful tree, this, this tree of, of virtue and of, of value and morality. And, and they rejected that by tearing it, the, selected a branch, which was reason, tore it off and sort of stuck it in the ground. And for a while, that, that fruit seems to work, right? There, there's still fruit on this branch. And then they could, the modernists would point to that and say, look, see, all that other stuff is bad. This, this thing actually works. Uh, but over time, what we find is that fruit begins to rot. And this is where we end up in postmodernism in our own times, where the modernists attempted a new thing. Um, they were optimistic about it. it, seemed to work for a while because of the borrowed capital or the, you know, the borrowed sap in the branch, but eventually it rots. And it fails because there's no root. There's no actual root in this branch. And so here we are in, in the postmodern period where um, we can't go back to tradition, apparently, because th that, would, that would force us to fit ourselves to an outside reality. And we don't like that because we're committed to our personal selves. We can't go back to modernism because that failed. That, that rationality and the, the whole system collapsed and and so that that doesn't work so here we are as postmodernists what do we do so I, I don't think it's shocking when you see postmodernist society very destabilized because you have individuals who made in the image of God want to have value but they have no way to get value that they, they can't go back to any of the things before they think and so all they're left with is themselves. But you can't get value from yourself. You try. We want to do that in postmodernism, but it fails. And so they're they're frustrated. They they have a desire, an innate desire to live with God and and actually be fulfilled in that. But they're trying to do it in a way that can't work. So they're constantly frustrated and discontent. And um, and then you speed that up. Another. Another author that, that we read in my classes uh, is Marshall McLuhan of Medium is a Message, but his, he, he has a number of works uh, like Understanding Media where he talks about the effect of electricity. And now, of course, computer, computers and Internet and the speeding up effect of that. So everything gets sped up um, in the postmodern world. So you have this sort of all at oneness. You can see everything all the time, but, but none of it is satisfactory. And so the, the individual, the individual postmodernist is in rebellion against the cosmos, uh, can, can get no satisfaction personally. And so they're, they're perpetually unhappy. And sometimes they band together with others and for a cause, but you know, they get allies. So you get allies, but you never get real community in postmodernism. So you have, you have individualists that will stick together for a certain time, but ultimately it's about them personally and, and it can't work. So where do we go from here? Maybe is another question. Mm -hmm. you know, where do we go from postmodern postmodernism? And uh, you know, again, I, I think as McLuhan talks about with the speeding up of everything, you, you're getting a tribalism that develops as, as we've seen, because you can connect with people like yourselves all over the planet if you want to in some way um but where where does that actually where does that actually end up that might take us back to uh, an openness Vith in his postmodern times talks about uh, postmodernists tend to be open to pre-modern things pre-modern ideas so there might be a, an openness to tradition um that we might see perhaps but it would mean that we have to be prepared to conform ourselves to an outside virtue and reality and value that that um that would change everything we, we would have to step out of ourselves and embrace that whether we're 
Yeah, would it take a crisis to do that? I don't know. Any final thoughts? Any questions for me? Yeah, I guess I would just my, my last word. I guess it would be just, again if people are thinking about this is is um, since education is concerned with fitting students for the world they actually live in, that's the kind of thing people need to think about for their own children. Mm-hmm. Right? What what is the world that that really that God has made? How do I best prepare my my children to be to be part of that world and you know to to love to know and to love the God of that world? Um, so think about education, you know, the, really looking at the school that you're. I mean, make it very personal because we've talked about you know philosophical systems, but looking at that individual school or way of schooling and making sure it it fits with the the world that God has actually made. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That's been great. Yeah. Thanks, Kristen. <laughs>